Hello and welcome to another episode of the SEO Unplugged podcast. I'm your host, Itamar Blauer. Today, I'm joined with Jonathan Moore, who's a freelance technical SEO and analytics consultant. Jonathan, how are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm not bad. It's a, I would say it's a nice day here. It's raining, but uh, I'm doing okay. You see, no one's going to know exactly what day it is, but as soon as you give that description, they're like, yeah, it just sounds like another day in the UK. A, I think I could just a typical day in Britain in, in September. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, today we're going to go talk past, I uh, think, well, I guess more positive types of topics and well, depending on which way you read about it, but we're going to be looking into troubleshooting SEO issues. So when it comes to SEO troubleshooting, I know yourself, Jonathan, you like to use different types of tools and you like to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, what actually gets served up on a website on the server and how sort of on the client side you might see it, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to SEO troubleshooting in general, if we sort of just take a step back, what are sort of the main types of instances or things that you notice when it comes to SEO troubleshooting from your experience? So I think in terms of in terms of troubleshooting, I think I think probably like the main examples of like things that I think probably could be more clarity is sort of when you get um you kind of want to avoid like puking issues right so like you run a like a crawler like screen frog site bulb and you get a load of issues right so without any context that can be quite problematic i'd say so i think that's probably like the single most thing that i want to be conscious of like when i'm auditing something is that i'm not just like puking a number that a tool has sort of outputted. I think the tool is a very useful for the first step in identifying like that there's a potential issue, right? But the next step for me would be then always sort of trying to verify that and ultimately find the root cause. Um, and normally that's finding the root cause through through a browser. Okay. And when you go and look within the browser, what are some of the things that you usually do in terms of your go-to methodology or process of trying to troubleshoot certain types of issues i, I know that's quite a generic question but on the mm -hmm. browser itself what are some of the things that you do usually so i suppose i'll give you a good, good, like a good example so screen frog will maybe normally give you like an indication of what the issue is right so say you've got um like page title issues right it's classic so you can go in then and start sort of manually inspecting them on say let's use an e-commerce context that you've got like a home page a list page and a product page. So you then start going in and like manually inspecting each of those pages. Um, so you can do that on like metadata as well. And you can just get an idea for how it's how it's constructed there in the browser. In that example as well, you can also do that quite easily in the tool. Um, but there's like other examples, I suppose, in like Screen Frog, which is quite useful. It gives you like the X path, sort of like so you can copy and paste that X path. You open Chrome, go into the elements panel and actually visually inspect that sort of individual link. So it's like a like a, a link that's redirecting, for example. So it allows you to sort of identify the pattern, right? So you can use that to say so spot a component. So like say you've got again e com, got a related product link to the bottom of the page. You can use that X path then to identify that that's the component that's ultimately got like a little maybe a little slight problem with it. So then you know that that component is triggering a load of a load of issues essentially. Okay, that's interesting because I think the and I'm I'm not going to speak for everyone, but from my experience in terms of where I've seen people utilizing uh, crawlers, for example, like Screaming Frog, is you kind of get the issues, you get a list of URLs, and then you're like, okay, everything here is uh, faulty for this particular or as part of this particular issue and we need to do x to fix it but i don't often see the actual manually going in and checking the you know inspecting mm -hmm. the pages looking at the particular lines of code where an issue may be triggered and of course there may be certain types of cases where it's not mandatory to do that because in some cases mm. it might be pretty self-explanatory in terms of how to go about fixing an issue but when it's quite interesting when you sort of actually go into the code and understanding the construct of a web page in terms of the code the x paths the different sort of areas that you have in the different sections and actually knowing where to go and what to sort of look for um and i know and i'll kind of move this on towards 
Chrome DevTools? Because I know this is something that you are very familiar with. It's something you utilize a lot. And I feel like not many people are using DevTools for SEO troubleshooting. So could you maybe give a little sort of reasoning of like why you like to use that and sort of what benefits it gives you when you're doing this troubleshooting? So I think, yeah, first point is where SEO is. Right? So there's multiple ways of getting the same outcome. So it's probably like a hierarchy of like debugging tools, right? You've got crawlers, then you've got like say browser extensions, and then you've got actually checking checking the web page. Um, so over time, you know, that's when I started, that would just be checking view source. Um, but over time, you know, we're now using inspect element to basically check check the DOM, right? The, what the browser's representation of the the rendered CSS, JS, and HTML looks like. So, so for me, I mean, it's two things really. It, it's curiosity. I think curiosity is is very important as SEOs because you understand then like the wider context. But I think most importantly, it's the relationship between things. And I find it a lot easier then to sort of identify that whilst identifying that root cause is then that that sort of that context behind that. And I find it really helpful then when I write tickets that I can sort of show specifically like it's some examples like you, know, you can show it specifically like this, this line of code here in this component is, is causing the problem. You can send a nice little screenshot of the page because DevTools does a nice job of highlighting as well. So you can take, take a screenshot of the, the page um, and, the, and the sort of the, the inspecting you know, of the source of the code. And and you know if you, you really want to be fancy, you can yeah you, know, you can right click that and copy the X path as well. So it really helps the developer like hone in on like what you're trying to ask them to fix as well. So it's also good I think for getting people on side as well, just because it, it's like a little bit of, I guess finesse. And in terms of using dev tools when you were sort of starting out using, because there's obviously a lot that you can do. What did you sort of find at least early on were some some quite efficient things that you could do with it any particular types of things that you sort of use as a default process i suppose when you're mm -hmm. looking through dev tools are there any sort of things that you just right off the bat go and do as part of your sort of just general processes yeah definitely so <clears throat> first thing i tend to do is i've got like a dedicated like auditing profile in chrome is maybe I have certain extensions installed, uninstalled. Um, so I can go and basically look at a site. So for me, sort of where like accelerated this process was, was Core Web Vitals because Core Web Vitals is sort of like, you know, you put it into uh, into the tool, you get a score out of 100, right? Um, and there's not much context a lot of the time in terms of what the root cause might be. So for me, that was like being able to deliver more meaningful uh, Core Web Vitals recommendations meant that I had to start going into into the browser a lot more, and from there, that sort of really accelerated my learning. Now, the first things that I will probably do in in Dev Tools is when I look at a page is I'll probably <clears throat> clear clear the network. So I go to the network tag normally first. I clear the net network. I might do other little things like right click, add the domain as like a as a column, and then I might set like request rows to big. And I'll probably turn off caching as well, and then uh, and then I'll, I'll enable screenshots as well. Screenshots, are, screenshots are useful. So I normally then do a page load, and I'm sort of then start checking sort of what resources are being reloaded and when. So that might be obvious checks to be first thing is normally like CSS uh, and fonts. Uh, what I look for there is. First check, I think, is just see if fonts are being initiated by CSS. I think that's like a really good value uh, optimization there is if you've got fonts being initiated by CSS, you know you can move them in, in line in the head. So I'm looking sort of what CSS and fonts are being loaded probably first of all. And then I start moving through like scripts. And I guess really the check there is are they async? Are they being deferred? Whereabouts in the head are they? Are they at the top of the head? Are they bottom of the head? Are they like close the body? So just get a feel there for like what's on the page, what libraries are being loaded. Maybe they're being loaded on like third party uh, resources. You see like like jQuery quite a bit being loaded like on a 
like on a CDN perhaps. So it just allows me to like build the build a picture in my head, like a mind map almost of like how the web page, what technology stacks being used, how it's being constructed. Um, so sort of tend to go through it that way. And then I might then uh, go to performance tab and do a performance load. And from there, you can sort of start seeing things like, cause it gives you the, uh, you know, things like, um, it indicates like layout shift, for example, uh, first content full paint, largest content full paint and so on. So that's very helpful there because you can see like the visual load of the page. So you can get an idea there if there's any issues there. So, so we'll normally do those two things and then it kind of then move in, you can move in and onto the elements tab, and then start doing like the classic sort of, I guess, SEO tech checks there. Um, but I mean, it's, for me, it's like just being curious. I think that's a large part of what I do. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out, like I'm knocking on a bit now. So when I started, like there were no tools. So I started, everything was in the browser. That's all we had. So over time, that's kind of like my background, just the way I, I learn, right? So you're always, what influences you when you're starting out it tends to have a big impact on like your philosophy. So it's worth pointing out that that's sort of where I've gone that route over time. But yeah, I think Core Web Vitals accelerated that, like going into dev tools and just being more curious about what you can do. And then like just started like, there's some really good videos on YouTube by uh, the Google developer team in terms of like using dev tools as well. So I started like watching a lot of them. Uh, there's like dev tool tips as well that uh, they do. Um, so just started getting more curious about it, trying to learn more. But then the other thing I started doing was like, um, I'm sure there's like certain browser extensions you use, like the IEMA, like redirect checker, like pretty much everyone uses that. It's like the gold standard of checking redirects in the browser, in my opinion. So I'd be like, look at that. I think like, how can I actually do that in the in the browser? So be sort of then, yeah, thinking like, how do I do that? And you know, I know then now that there's like buttons you can basically tick to turn that on and off. Uh, I might be thinking like, how do I change my user agent to Googlebot? So I now know that's in like network conditions. And it's just like in the drop down there. How do I turn off JavaScript? So sort of like add these little layers of basically just these are things that I would check anyway using an extension or uh, just like, okay, how do I do this in the browser? So over time I've got better at it. That's how it sort of built up that sort of those layers of checks. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I suppose then the question there is when you are performing these checks and when you're troubleshooting, is it typically a checklist of things that you will always look to do? And the reason why I ask that is because from a troubleshooting perspective, to me, it sounds like a checklist is actually quite a, a sensible thing to do because you're sort of trying to check all the different possibilities of things that could go wrong and you're sort of going one by one and just making sure that you either pass it or you fail it to sort of, you know, dig deeper and, and understand what the potential issues might be. But then within SEO in general, a lot of people would argue that you shouldn't really use checklists because if you just follow a checklist, you don't necessarily maybe know why something has happened or if something is going to contribute positively towards a certain type of page performing better on search. So how would you sort of, uh, I, I guess, address that argument, but from the sort of more troubleshooting aspect of SEO? Yeah, I think, I think one of the the things I would encourage every SEO to be aware of is like paradox. So like what works for client X doesn't necessarily work for client Y, right? What works in country A doesn't work in country B, right? So that's like the pitfall of following like a very well-defined list of checks, right? So like, you know, for my agency days, you're definitely, definitely going to, when you're starting out, you're going to be following a list of checks. And I think that's absolutely hundred percent the right thing to do because it's like, if I took my car in for, for MOT, um, for those who don't know in Britain, you've got to put your car in once a year to make sure that it's, uh, uh, it's not dangerous, right? That other road users, there's certain checks they have to do, right? Like, like the emission, right? My car always fails on the emissions. So certain checks you're going to have to do. And I think that's very important. If we tie that back to the paradox though, it's like, 
you know, like for example, like what Google say might work doesn't necessarily always work. So there's this level of, I think, manual checks. And again, that ties it back to that curiosity because there's certain checks that maybe over time you might not do as much, right? Because you feel like that they, they're not as important, right? So I'll just use like pagination as an example, right? Google say like, now don't need to use rel pre the next to indicate a paginated series of pages, right? So if you're following a check that is like sort of um, following the Google guidelines verbatim, you might not, you might not even do that check anymore, right? So I think there's a bit of, you need to do some other things that are always definitely, definitely more valuable. Um, I think even like examples I've spoken to people about in the last week is like checking, like checking like what, uh, where you know, if you're on shared shared host, for example, people might not do that as much anymore, or like maybe very different contexts is like disavowing. So I think it's definite. It depends on like I think the style of audit you're doing it isn't necessarily a one size fits all approach, but I think. Definitely use checklists for the essential, I call it like the essential non-essentials, right? But you definitely need to do a bit of digging. And for me, what steers that is like, I guess the situational awareness I have of site performance. So probably prior to that, I do a lot of analytics work, um, good search console work to get a real feel for like actually what does performance look like? Is it going up? Is it going down? What page templates? Uh, what departments are performing well, not performing well. Normally time series data is a very good indication of that. You know, you can use other tools like like Systrix, for example, to give you an idea of if there's issues with algorithm updates. So I'm trying to again get that wider context, the relationship between actual performance and then what might be the root cause of that. Is it a technical issue? Is it is it something else we've missed? Again bearing in mind that sort of paradox situation that what you think might work isn't always the case in what we do, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that kind of sums it up nicely in the sense where you're obviously going to have to treat every website as unique. So they're going to have their unique challenges and you kind of need to make the assumption that even though you did something for a different website that might be, I don't know, in a similar niche or a similar setup, it's not necessarily going to be the case that everything you did for that site is something all the issues you found for that site are going to be consistent with the site you're working on at the moment and i think the the sort of curiosity aspect i think is a really good way to maybe persuade people to just have a deeper think and actually really dive deeper into these types of things like your dev tools actually going into the browser and checking things and not maybe just solely taking a crawler's advice of or like a list of urls is sort of like oh this is the problem this is what it means this is how we fix it but actually like going in and verifying things because at least from from what i've seen is like there's certain cases where a crawler will say there's this problem here where you actually go in and it's not the case and a lot of time it might even come to the actual like server request for it to even crawl a, a url correctly and then it will give you a certain status code and then you might think oh oh this there's a server issue here da, 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 or this problem's come about but actually you go into it and you just realize that actually it's a 200 but the actual crawler wasn't able to to look at that mm. particular url which happens right so and i think that obviously with things like dev tools it is maybe just another thing to to get to to terms with and it's still something that i honestly had like speaking with people not many people are using um and i would like to hope maybe that this conversation has sort of inspired people to to go that bit further and try try out something new or at least go into dev tools more and experiment more whether that's with you know your elements your your network conditions all of these different things and I, I think that, again, from conversations we've had offline, you know, there's there's always a lot of, of good nuggets that you that you share as well. Um, so, Jonathan, just to wrap things up, where can people find you if they have some questions or want to get in touch about, you know, troubleshooting, tech SEO or analytics stuff? Uh, probably LinkedIn is probably the best place. So you can hopefully do a search for Jonathan Moore. Uh, I think my name on LinkedIn is like Moore Jonathan. I'm on I'm on X Twitter. 
but my name's Nathan Less, so people might not know who I am, but it is, it is actually me. So you can find me on, on X Twitter as well, but I think LinkedIn's okay. So yeah, if you've got like any questions, you know, just, just send over request or you know, good old fashioned. I do have a website, so you can find me on that as well. So, uh, but yeah, always happy to help if anyone's got any specific questions or would like me to share any like resources with them as well. So I've got, got a few things there I can share. Fantastic. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time and thank you for everyone listening out there as well. Oh, and as, as always, we'll see you in the next episode. Hey, you've reached the end of this video, but don't worry, there's plenty more great content that you can watch right now. All you have to do is click one of the two video links on the left side of the screen. And also, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell to never miss out on future uploads.